conversation today, my guest describes himself as a son of the soil with a passion for the mountains. He's had a long, distinguished career in the civil service as Secretary Petrochemical, Secretary Agriculture. He spent more than two and a half years in the shadow of the redoubtable Mr. T. N. Session in the Election Commission to emerge more than six months ago as the Chief Election Commissioner of India. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. M. S. Gill. Welcome, Mr. Gill. Thank you. You know, I noticed when you came in for this interview, I'd, I'd expected um, a large sort of retinue of security guards to precede you. Uh, in, in what ways do you feel you have perhaps changed the, the, the atmosphere at uh, the election bubble? No, I mean that preceded by black cat commandos, I think is obscene. I think uh, this very poor country, I don't accept the word developing. I think you should use the direct language. Uh, I think it's being loaded with one more burden of some maybe 70, 80, 100 crores in ritual security, which is status security, which has no meaning. And I have known the armed forces of this country, civil and police. It demeans even those commandos and those soldiers. So I, I, I don't think most of us need them. If they insist, yes, I have one or two minimum uh, sometimes. But I think we have to relook this. And I notice that everybody in authority is saying they will. But what's stopping them doing it? Just cut it down, cut it down on all of us everywhere. And they use that money somewhere to give drinking water or a school. In what way does this, uh, this sort of your, your, your deciding to shed this represent a change of, of, of culture, of, of ethos? No, it's not a question of shed it. First of all, bulletproof cars in the election commission of India. Let me put, put to you my preposition. I, I meaning whoever is in this chair or these kind of chairs, if I am trying to serve the people of India to help them choose who they wish to govern themselves, why should they want to hurt me? Why should I be guarded like uh, some of these tin pot dictators around the world? So I can't say, I think it's a great contradiction. Do you feel you spent uh, four years uh, in the election commission as an election commissioner? Do you feel that that was sort of time written off for you in some ways? No, I didn't spend four years. Uh, I think about two, two and a half years. Yes, it was time lost to me. It was time lost to the commission and the country. Because, I mean, this is history. You want to go over it. But the fact is that when I was appointed along with another colleague, it was as per the constitution, the same president had appointed us. And then, somehow in a judicial blockage, stay order and that kind of thing, uh, we, were, we were kind of, you know, idle and dangling almost for two years. Now, this is unacceptable because I, I accept anybody's right to go to the courts, but here was the highest judicial commission of India, election commission of India, one of the highest constitutional authorities. And if there is a question raised, I think this is something will remain in judicial history. The courts had every duty to immediately settle it in whichever direction. Now, a two-year stay order till, uh, you know, that is, and, and that, uh, of course, I lost. You know, you have that much time in life. What, what is your, your personal response to that? I think there was a wide expectation that you might become cabinet secretary and then you came in here. And what did that do to you in, in, in personal ways? Well, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I'm not a Buddha, and I think nobody can be a Buddha in the sense that you do feel and you do hurt a little bit. But I also long ago saw, you know, a picture on Sir Thomas More, Queen Elizabeth I, you know, and he had played all roles, and finally she beheaded him. And uh, the picture was named A Man for All Seasons. I think you've got to try and be one. So if this was the wicket they gave me to play on, then I had to bat it, as I said once. Uh, you know, the only stroke I play is forward defensive because here is a situation, I am on a sticky wicket and the googly bowler is also the umpire. So if I lift my head even, there's going to be a catch in the gully. So I just had to play that role, what could I do? So now are you on a, on a, on a good batting wicket and, and, and what is your agenda? I did believe that this job cannot be left to one man, whoever he be, me today or you tomorrow. And uh, that's what you find now, six months, we are a three-member commission. I anxiously pushed to have the vacancy filled. 
and we are a three member commission we work as a commission we have equal authority and i am not interested in having superior authority because my view of things which i made clear is i believe on a issue which uh, i think i am right on i have the confidence that i can persuade my two colleagues but i also have the conviction that if i cannot persuade them and they hold to something then their view must be better than mine and i am willing to follow it without reservation and therefore we go along fine and we are trying to do what should be done to the best of our ability what are some of the important agenda that you have uh, i think the agenda is how to maintain a good reasonably good if not perfectly good election system which by and large delivers the mandate the people want how to do it peacefully how to do it without contention how to keep the temperature of politics down these are the basic agendas and i don't think they will change it's not a question of because what i think you're pointing to is the mechanics of doing it but i think the thrust is in that direction that the indian people should be able to really get who they really want you know they are thwarted sometimes they are prevented sometimes not everywhere but in pockets across the country the efforts are made to bully them and all that kind of thing happens now we keep looking at how we can you know block that one because every now and then you get something thrown uh, the indian people have vast ingenuity in whichever field they are in industry in business in banking i mean even the scams they come out of a very sharp brain by the way you know and uh, the same in politics so we have to you know be up with whatever is going on and try in a democratic way in a way that works for the country and works for the long run not for the short run because uh, i have always said that mere thanedari is not going to solve it thanedari is also uh, of diminishing effect uh, you might have seen in any case it's not a long term change and they get wise and then they do something else so it's a question of long term and we keep thinking of those kind of things i think for example this current uh, Uh, party elections now here is something new i think uh, we managed to have carried forward because it's it's a new area for the commission and the country that the election commission of india urged the parties 45 recognized parties we are concerned with them mainly that you must follow the internal democracy which you have put in your constitution which you have filed with us based on which we have given you privileges of symbol and so many other things in law yet an activist uh, election commission where does it stop now there's concern you know the courts are intervening as to whether these elections are being legitimately conducted uh, have the process has been fair uh, where does activism of the no, election we are not activist this much we followed but uh, you might have also noticed that we urged them to have elections and i am happy to say that all 45 barring none came up in writing and otherwise in friendly dialogue and they went forward and you know they more or less completed you are only looking at two parties national in delhi but you look across the country jayalalitha's parties whether they split or not is not my concern the akali dal there every party everywhere mr chandrashekar the ex prime minister big and small they've all done it but i am anxious that the current thing on one particular party should not go on and on and on because then it will be killing democracy and it will be ultimately killing the objective which we have with the agreement of 45 parties carried forward that henceforth all indian recognized parties shall follow their constitution which they have written you did not ask them i did not ask them and they shall follow them and they shall hold elections on the due date for example the congress has a new president but in 2 years time they shall choose another one what about parties that that have a constitution which doesn't call for elections that also will be looked at i can assure you i know what way you are pointing out and we have gently indicated to everybody that everybody has to go forward only in one direction because that is the country's mandate that is the uh, mandate to us from the constitution and the laws made by parliament under that constitution democracy if one goes by the sort of the, the cliche that ev- every country or every people get the government uh, or, or the politicians that they deserve uh, what role is there for activism on on the parts of of, of the courts and the election commission uh in some ways politics as as is now played represents the kind of people we are perhaps well i i look at it differently slightly uh in the sense that of course first of all you know it's not not all that negative i don't view it at all 
uh, when there has been talk of criminalization of politics and things like that, and our elitist press also plays it up tremendously, and so do some others, I look at it differently. Let me give you the positive of Indian even elections and politics. With all our imperfections in the politics and in the commission and whatever system we run, the structure, the bureaucracy which ultimately helps me do elections, and the police, and even they've been chipped away over 50 years, one thing you will grant me, that how is it that India in 50 years has regularly overthrown prime ministers and chief ministers? In fact, some of the people still manage it. And that is the ultimate test of the reasonableness of an election, not perfection. That's one. So I think spare a thought for all these people. Second, uh, you know, when we highlight certain cases, I have been saying in the past that in 50 years, and not even these 50 years, our politics goes back to the 35 Act and 37 elections and followed on and on. And further behind 35 Act to the 1919 Minto Morley and those elections. So we, to us, this is nothing new. Nobody is uh, teaching you today. It's 80 years or more. And in all that, you know, you, you highlight a few, but I say don't tar the whole political structure of India, all parties barring none. There are lakhs of party workers who trudge the dusty Indian roads, and I always look at rural roads, not Delhi, real India. And they have gone on educating and projecting policies and ideologies. That is also deepening democracy. And most of them never even become a local municipality or a panchayat official. So why do we tar all of those guys who spend a lifetime and fade away in their uh, thin dhoti hmm? uh, with the brush which I see in Delhi? So I look to all of that. And that's why my preposition when you ask oh, what is your agenda for reforms, I don't look at the mechanics we shall do 1 to 10. I might have. I, do, I have those also and my colleagues have. No, let me give you uh, a more basic philosophical preposition. I say... You do all these, and these keep on improving the system somewhat. But at the end of the day, good elections, in my view, can only be a product of near total literacy and reasonable economic development. My model in India is not Punjab, Kerala. They have 100% literacy, therefore the lowest birth rate. Therefore, civilized politics. Nobody accuses them of booth capturing or of uh, the kind of criminals that you uh, uh, allege elsewhere. Hmm? So that's one. Literacy and education and give the people a chance. In fact, it's amazing what the people have achieved in spite of what we have not given them. Hmm? Second, jab peti bilkul buka hai, kuch bhi nahi hai, dhoti bhi nahi hai, parna bhi nahi hai, and I have been to parts of India, I will not name states because my life has been in development and wandering around. Then how do you expect them even to look after my identity card? Is he going to guard that or is he going to cover himself? So some economic development. Otherwise, for how long will we maintain this system on $200 uh, per capita? So this is the way I look at it. I don't look at it negatively. You're watching In Conversations today with the Chief Election Commissioner, Dr. M. S. Kill. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Dr. Gill, you've drawn attention to uh, the, the greatest, perhaps, challenge for Indian democracy being the nature and strategies of our development. Uh, you've spent a long career in the civil service working in areas of development. Uh, you did uh, work at Cambridge, uh, Diploma and Development Studies. Um, what do you think are some of the major challenges for India in terms of its development priorities? There have been such major ideological shifts in approaches to development. Well, I mean, I, I can only make some comment on the current situation. I do believe that there's no way you're going to lift this billion people and this vast subcontinent. And all of us, if you think by delicensing and by pockets of industry or a, whatever kind of industry, that's another question come up here and there. If you don't lift rural India, which is the real India, there is ultimately that vast population sitting out in the villages, even in agriculture, there are only pockets of development. When you talk of India as self-sufficient, you are fudging it. You are frankly talking of 70%, 60% coming from this tiny pocket called Punjab, which is 50,000 square kilometers only, and the little remaining coming from Haryana. 
Hmm? And both of them put together are not even 3 to 4 percent of India's area or land or people. And frankly, this is a unique situation. A tiny pocket in a corner of the country keeps it away from famine somewhat. Hmm? Now, that's not, uh, uh, that's not, in my view, uh, food security. It's too fragile for that matter. And you see what was happening this year if they thought farmers are not going to give them wheat. That's one. Second, uh, even if you look at the future, I think in four or five years' time into the next century, 2004, if I recall my figures now, or I can still read a bit, uh, you're going to need 220 million tons of grain. And we are struggling around and about 190 plus and minus. Monsoon is good, so the ministry has done wonders. And monsoon dila ho jaye, hum dile ho jate hai. But we are just floating up and down over 90. What 190. initiatives would you take in this hmm? area? What you would I take? Yes. Oh, it's a long set of agendas. For example, <clears throat> let me give you one thought. If the Punjab level of yields, and they are not the greatest in the world, you know. Remember, Punjab is really just, just ko aamai in Punjabi mein kehte hai, anya de vich kaana pradhan. In the blind one, one eyed is marvelous. So we are okay. If that yield or even approaching that yield was done by UP and Bihar alone, then India won't be struggling for 225 million in five years' time, which India won't have. And I don't know how they're going to feed them. Hmm? Then India, if UP Bihar, this Ganges River, hmm, it's got better soil than Punjab. And the water, I always joke, not even joke, why should I? It's serious that Hamare Pas, to, you know, we only have Indus water, you have Ganges water. It should push up the yield by 5%. Am I right? Holy water. Hmm? If they did that, India would be talking of 250 to 300 million tons of grain. We won't know what to do with it. But it's a whole social and administrative problem why it is not happening there. I could go on and on into it, but I won't. And frankly, just this Gangetic belt could feed India for the next 30, 40, 50 years. But they have to. Why aren't they doing what Punjab has done? That's a question, not the politics which every day you read about. Uh, this one against that well, one. Why, why aren't they doing what they ought to be doing? I'll give you a sentence which Babu Jagjeevan Ram said to some Punjab men, also agriculture experts, I am not one actually, they were real agriculture experts. He said the problems of Bihar are sociology, not technology. I believe they still remain. Whether they are caste, whether they are high and low, whether it is worth it, ethics, there are a million arguments and thoughts one can debate, but they're still there and I think Babuji said it all. Now how it is to be done, what is to be done, all those are bigger questions. For example, after seeing my country and after spending four years in Nigeria, which is a giant to Africa, what India is to Asia, I believe for development and administration, no Indian state should be more than 25 to 30 million. You cannot manage. Are you despairing and cynical about India? No, I am not despairing because where I come from, we don't despair anyway, whatever may be happening. But I, I think uh, people have to pick up and fight more for this. I, I, I accuse the Punjab. Why is the Punjab 58% literacy? They could have gone equal and better than Kerala long ago. It's a failure in the Punjab in which I have taken part. And the Indian total, Burma the other day I was reading is 80%. And when you look around, because the Indians are so full of themselves, you know, they think everybody else is nothing and we are the world's greatest democracy. Merely numbers makes you greatest. What are you talking about? Numbers should worry you. Frankly, I also said once in uh, Mr. Narsimha Rao's government in a chief minister's meeting, and I said it to all of them, I said population planning should be part of agriculture policy. Because no agriculture secretary, I said then for myself, can feed you the rate you're going. And I've just given you numbers. Abhi 25 million aajayega paain saal mein. You tell me where it's going to come from. I don't know. Very rarely, if at all, is education or health uh, on the political agenda of any party. Why do you think that is? Well, some of them are even accused of keeping pockets like that. Because it's the easy vote banks in whichever way you manipulate. You can't capture booths in Punjab or Haryana or uh, other states like that or Kerala. But maybe elsewhere you can. So yes, sir, that is an accusation one has to worry about. But of course, what you are hitting at, what should be done? Now, I can't give you a solution on changes in the constitution. And the, I mean, you are really pointing to things like that. But I also worry that when people talk of changes in constitution or something like that, 
you see this is an easy escape route in india 40 years you mess around with one system and then you immediately say give me another so that you can fool around for another 40 ultimately constitutions are only so good as the men who run them i believe that now how the men either we get on the elite all of us which is doing uh, running this country all combined together in whichever area we work either we do better or i'm afraid then india has to you know get rid of us what else will india do someday it might do it you're watching in conversation today with dr ms gill the chief election commissioner of india we'll be right back after a short break welcome back uh, dr gill sometime back uh, again before the interview really got rolling on camera uh, we were talking about passion and anger and, and you said how important it was to have legitimate passion and legitimate yeah, anger yeah, I that. what are some of the things that you feel angry about as i said are we going to celebrate 50 years of illiteracy i mean uh, it, it angers me i've just given you examples thailand indonesia malaysia burma they're all 80 to 90 percent uh, i went to iran and one thing hit me uh, 15 years ago when these people took over they were 25 percent literacy and i was told 75 now so they pushed now i don't know why we can't get on with these kind of things so it it angers me i can't see why we can't feed ourselves i just explained to you it angers me i can't see why in up and bihar we can't grow so much grain that we knock america out of the world grain market it angers me if you were celebrating and announced said what shall we celebrate on the 15th of august 1997 what might you celebrate well i think what i would celebrate yes we are free we are an open society we have not allowed ourselves to be muzzled indians love to speak up you can see what i'm doing just shooting off and thank god they can go on doing it otherwise in poverty that we have most societies have immediately muzzled everybody and uh, mind you with the mechanics of power today and military and the all sorts of agencies that you can create in the police you can hold the people down for pretty long periods and i won't name countries but they are being held people even within asia large countries and uh, even when they call an election it's a mockery there is no election uh, but thank god this country no every indian uh, can get up and say what he feels like about the prime minister or the president or the election commission and they do have debate and they are free people i think therefore our spiritual self is still safe that is what i feel that is what i'll celebrate uh, tell me that uh, as 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 a someone who has served the nation in so many capacities um, what contributions do you feel you have left to make to the nation election commission and beyond no no that's that's too pompous <laughs> because we were not of that level to talk of what contributions we have made to the nation no, no that's too pompous for me anyway uh, i mean all that i try to do in my civil service career uh, yes as i say i do feel uh, you know it's a it's a bit of a, a cliche to say like mahatma gandhi but certainly uh, sadly he is uh, in the political hierarchy, one of the few people who did strongly say village India, light a lamp. And once I quoted him, I said, do you realize only Punjab has lighted a lamp in the countryside? Because we really took it to the villages. 10,000 villages, 30,000 kilometers of rural roads, metaled. I machine metal them before I came to Delhi in 88 end. So, uh, you see, uh, it's it's too pompous to say what i have done but wherever i was in the civil service and uh, i think i've tried to uh, passionately make an effort not just sit back and kind of take it as civil service and uh, certainly i did feel always emotionally linked to people people down there i don't give up that i left my village 40 years ago but i never forget muhammad ali the boxer never look down on those who look up to you Thank you very much, Dr. Gill. That's been a great privilege. Thank you.